This is Dr. Tim Witham. You're listening to Interview with the Surgeon with the Surgeon Agent. On this episode of Interview with the Surgeon, we welcome Dr. Timothy Witham, Professor of Neurosurgery and Orthopedic Surgery at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. His interests include the surgical treatment of degenerative conditions of the cervical and lumbar spine, including instrumented fusion procedures. He also has an expertise in the treatment of spinal tumors, spinal trauma, and spinal deformity. Dr. Witham serves as Director of Johns Hopkins Neurosurgery Spinal Fusion Laboratory, Director of Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center Spine Program, and Co-Program Director of the Johns Hopkins Neurosurgery Residency Program. Dr. Witham's research interests include finding novel ways to achieve spinal fusion and improving surgical techniques in the aging spine. A co-author of more than 170 peer-reviewed articles and abstracts, Dr. Witham has been featured as a top doctor in Baltimore Magazine and was a recipient of the United States Air Force Meritorious Service Medal in 2005. He is a member of various professional organizations, including the American College of Surgeons and American Association of Neurological Surgeons. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Interview with the Surgeon. Today, we have Dr. Tim Witham. Dr. Witham, how are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for being with us. So let's just kind of jump right into it. You know, what were your goals and aspirations during your residency, and how did those change throughout your fellowship? Yeah, so for me, you know, the goals during residency, I, I sort of wanted to set myself up so that all options would be available. Now, I had a little bit of a unique uh, career path because I had a military obligation waiting for me when I finished residency. Um, So I knew I'd have to do that. But with that in mind, I didn't know what was going to happen after I finished that commitment and that payback. So I think, you know, it's always a really good idea to set yourself up for any type of job environment or any type of job opportunity. So I think that you know, focusing on some of the academic uh, portions of the residency is really important. And, you know, that involves uh, getting active with research, um, trying to get involved with as many projects as you can so that you can get as many publications out there as you can, uh, present at as many meetings possible. But, you know, certainly that's not the only focus. You're, you want to hone your skills as a surgeon um, and you want to be the, techni- the best technical surgeon that you can be. And so you, you also want to hit, hone your skills in the operating room and spend a lot of time in the operating room, uh, a really great technician. And that's also going to translate into success, you know, in the outside world. Did my goals change uh, in the fellowship? No, but my fellowship, again, was done. I finished residency, did a four-year uh, commitment in the United States Air Force. Um, I, af- I was able to get board certified while I did that. And so my goals of fellowship were sort of to enhance my training in a more focused area, in this case, spine surgery. And again, try to set myself up for the best possible job opportunity afterwards. And I sort of toyed around with possible private practice options, but also academic options where I ultimately ended up. So thinking about that, you know, going through the uh, job process and obviously after the military commitment, what was your mentality really going through that? And how did that change throughout the beginning years after the military commitment? focus actually switched. And that's something that, um, you know, I think is also important for for trainees to to understand is that, you know, your life can take some twists or turns that may not be expected. And so my sort of specialty interest within side of neurosurgery changed. And part of that had to do with my experience in the Air Force. Um, I started out being very interested in, in brain tumors or neuro-oncology. And what happened when I got into the Air Force was the, the ability to, to take care of those patients you know, diminished considerably. There, just, there weren't that many patients with, that were presenting with brain tumors in that setting, in that practice environment. And, uh, and so the majority of the patients that I was taking care of were, were spine patients. And, you know, that's sort of the majority of the patients in neurosurgery as a whole, uh, particularly outside of the academic world. But um, 
I, you know, I felt perfectly comfortable doing spine procedures because that's what I had done as a resident. I had tried to, tried to scrub on as many different kinds of procedures as I could. And I didn't kind of pigeonhole myself into any one particular area so that I felt I had a pretty good background in general training. And so when I got into the military and I was seeing a lot of spine patients, I sort of said to myself, look, I, I want to sort of be the best at this. And um, I took more of an interest in that. And spine was also something that I felt I would be much more marketable in outside of the military or moving forward at that point in my career. So I sort of changed my focus and got on a pathway more focused on spine. And that's when I began to look at fellowship opportunities for when I finished so that um, I could even hone my skills a little bit more. I knew I was going back into an area of the, of the country when I got finished with the Air Force that was a fairly competitive marketplace because I knew was, I was moving back into the Northeast. And, you know, there are tons of neurosurgeons, tons of spine surgeons in the Northeast. And so you have to be, you know, a really well-polished and well-trained surgeon to get the competitive job that you want. Now, can you kind of take us through the process of from military to the job to where you were chief down in Mississippi and then kind of how you got to Johns Hopkins? What was that journey like for you? You know, the military job was, um, you know, it definitely had pros and cons. Um, it, it was definitely something that, um, helped me fulfill my goals, particularly in terms of eliminating any debt from medical school. Um, I really had virtually no debt. Um, but I would say the flexibility in terms of your career is a little bit limited. I mean, somebody is sort of controlling your life for four years. Um, the, the pay in the Air Force is obviously less than it would be in the private sector and even the academic sector. So most people after they fulfill their commitment leave. And so that was always something that I was planning on. But I sort of at that time had to sort of line up my next move. And um, I would say kind of halfway through my four year commitment, I started looking at opportunities. I, I was sort of uh, at the time because of my family situation, I I was limited geographically, and so I was um, looking at opportunities in, Balt in the Baltimore area, and I reached out to um, uh, my fellowship mentor, who was Diego Coslin, who had just moved from MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston uh, and had taken the chief uh, spine uh, division director at Hopkins and just really just came up, to, uh, met up with him at a meeting. I'd never met him before. Um, and I just, uh, I grabbed him at the end of one of his talks and said, Hey, are you, um, are you looking to develop or expand a fellowship program up there? I'd, I'd be interested. And, uh, you know, he had, you know, he, he was in fact interested in doing that. And so that really got the ball rolling on it. And, um, you know, we were in contact through email. I sent him my CV and, and it was, I think, kind of being at the right place at the right time that, that sort of landed me that opportunity. And then thinking about that, you know, I think one thing that most of residents and fellows are curious about now is, you know, kind of how you met your mentor. You rub shoulders with him at a conference. Right now, we don't have that ability to do that. Everything's virtual right now. Um, so what type of things are you talking to residents and fellows about as far as the outreach process when they can't see people face to face? Yeah, so I think it's it's really important to whatever institution you are training at or training in, um, you want to start to lean on your own mentors there because the field of neurosurgery and spine surgery, it's a pretty small world. I mean, there are a lot of people um, have connections um, in so I think in, a, in the situation with COVID, what you have to do is you have to really reach out to your mentors and, uh, you know, ask them to, to reach out to their colleagues that they know 
across the country and, and, and probably network that way. And, um, you know, my sense is that's the way a lot of jobs um, are landed is kind of through this networking that occurs through your own institution and that word of mouth spreads and, and that's how you start to, to look at opportunities. I agree. It's all with the outreach process. Now, I think it's always interesting. Everyone has their own uh, unique views, but what would you say were some of the keys of your success uh, throughout your early part of your career to get to where you are right now? Yeah, I mean, I think that what you have to do is you have to kind of think about sort of, you know, putting your head down at the beginning of your career and, and really working as hard as you can. And I think that that pays off later on. Keep in mind, um, keep your eyes open to anything. Um, you know, I never completely ruled out the possibility of, of, of really any kind of employment opportunity, including opportunities in private practice or academics. I always sort of felt that academics is what would suit me the best. But you know, even when I was coming out of the Air Force, I was looking at some private practice opportunities in, in Baltimore. But, um, you know, I think it's important to, to just keep your eyes open, put your head down, work as hard as you can at the beginning of your um, practice, um, because I think then it kind of, it can pay off later on down the road. Now, seeing that you work with your residency program there, what type of advice do you have for the graduating residents and fellows as they get into that mindset of approaching the job market for the first time? Well, I think you need to probably start early, you know, start putting out your feelers early, um, which means probably at the beginning of the chief residency year. Um, and in particular, I think with COVID, that's probably important because, you know, there may not be many on-site interviews. You're probably going to be doing Zoom interviews. Um, you know, hopefully that'll change that come the spring when, when the graduates are getting ready to finish up. But, um, I think getting started early and, and looking at as many opportunities as possible, you know, and that may mean uh, not restricting yourself to you know, one area of the country or another versus another, although you may be locked into that, that kind of thing. Just, uh, getting as many opportunities as you can look at. So during your career, did you ever consider going private or were you academic focused all the way? Yeah, so early on, uh, as I was getting uh, out of my uh, Air Force commitment, I did uh, take a look at uh, some private practice opportunities. Um, and ultimately for me, uh, I felt like doing an additional year of training and fellowship was uh, gonna be a better option. Um, again, I felt like this was a, a bit of an um, investment uh, that might pay off uh, toward my next job. I felt that developing some additional skills, um, some more complex skills at Hopkins, uh, my mentor uh, was basically world renowned for his, um, uh, for spinal oncology, re reconstruction of the spine after sort of radical resections of spinal tumors. And this was a skill set that I think uh, was extremely valuable. Um, and extremely beneficial for me to learn. Um, but I think more than that, it, it helped me land my first job, which was staying on faculty because I was able to, I, I think, um, demonstrate my skills and work ethic and, and talents and, and show that, you know, I'd be a valuable team member. And so they asked me to stay on the program. But um, but I was seriously considering private practice at that time. And I would say that um, even uh, subsequent to that, I've had several uh, situations or times during my career, which has now been, I've been on faculty at Hopkins for 15 years where I've looked at some private practice opportunities. And, you know, I will say that um, there are certainly opportunities that are potentially more lucrative um, and that was one of the reasons why I looked at one point. Um, and, uh, but I think you do have to be careful in that regard. Um, uh, I almost did take a job in private practice, actually. Um, and there are 
complex reasons why I didn't. But um, one of the things that I, I think is probably underrated about academics, and yes, the, the, the pay is probably on the average a little bit lower than, than private. Um, there's no value that can be placed on having residents sort of in the hospital 24-7. Uh, um, if you like doing things outside of medicine, which I do, um, I'm someone who works to live. I don't live to work. Um, I really value my time outside of, out of, outside of the hospital. Um, and the, route, the residents are invaluable in that regard because, you know, you have someone who is basically your eyes and ears in the hospital working for you. Um, and that's, I think, saves you a lot of time. And um, I don't think there's a dollar value that can be placed on that. And I think that for those who really enjoy the interaction between, you know, mentor, mentee, whether you're on the mentor side or the mentee side, you know, academics offers that and it can continue throughout your career. Whereas, yes, those opportunities might exist in private practice, but I think it's, it's different and um, uh, maybe, maybe not as many opportunities in, in the private sector. Now, I think something that a lot of our viewers like to learn about is kind of talk about the first augmented surgery that you guys did at Johns Hopkins. What was the idea behind it and how did it go? Yeah, so it went really well. I mean, we were fortunate enough to um, get involved with a company that uh, came up with the first uh, head-mounted uh, augmented reality uh, neuro navigation system. Um, and it was something that I along with several of my colleagues here at Hopkins, had a chance to um, play around with in, in the laboratory, in the cadaver lab. And, and we actually, uh, based on the results in, in a cadaver lab on a Saturday afternoon, uh, we actually helped uh, move the technology forward uh, in terms of getting FDA approval. And the concept behind this device is that um, neuronavigation is, is a common technology in neurosurgery, as you know, all, of the, all of the trainees will know. But the, the game changer here, or the diff difference maker here, is that most systems require that you look at a remote uh, computer screen while you're operating on the patient. So what happens is there's something called a tension shift where you're, you're trying to do the work on the patient, but you're looking off at a computer screen while you're doing the work. Whereas it would be more intuitive that you could look at the navigation system while you're doing the work on the patient, directly having your view of, of the inside of the patient, or even if you're doing a percutaneous procedure, you know, the outside of the patient. So what this company that we were able to work with did was they developed a head-mounted display that is, um, or a head-mounted navigation system with a camera built into the head-mounted system um, that has uh, uh, little lenses that directly display the CT scan images on your retina while you're looking inside the patient. Um, and then there's also a 3D reconstruction of the spine that's involved with that uh, CT uh, reconstructed data. Um, and it's really cool and it's, it's, it's much more intuitive, I think, to learn. I think the learning curve will be much faster as people start to use this technology. Um, but as a result of uh, helping to push that technology forward, we were fortunate enough to be able to do the first case at Johns Hopkins. Um, and it went, it went very well. Um, we've done, I think now about seven cases since, um, and, uh, that's within a pretty short period of time and during COVID. So, um, it's really cool. And it's, it's fun to use also. I think that's, uh, the other point, but, um, yeah, we're very excited about this technology. We hope you enjoyed this episode of interview with the surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.